Thank you, Dr. Kamdar, for that inspiring speech and uh, for taking us through the transformations that have happened in the field of education in the last 25 years. Now, before we move on, we would like to apologize um, for some of the dignitaries and some of you have to sit at the back. Uh, we were oversubscribed for this event and we tried our best to accommodate you, but thank you for understanding. And I would like to take a moment to just tell everyone to please put your phones on silent just so that our speakers don't get disturbed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to set the tone for the event, our first keynote speaker is Professor Padma Sarangpani, Professor of Education and Chairperson Center of Excellence in Teacher Education at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. As a doyen of Indian education, <laughs> ma'am doesn't need an introduction, but as an alumna of TIS and um, representing an organization that has many TIS alumni in its fold, I cannot let go of the opportunity to introduce ma'am. It's an honor and a privilege to have her amongst us. Uh, Padma Ma'am has served on the board of multiple national and state level think tanks and policy working groups on issues spanning from teacher education, curriculum development, and innovative practices in education. She's also worked in secondary education, educational assessment. She has led various committees to deliver policy recommendations which have deeply impacted governance at the highest level in the country. Dr. Sarangpani's numerous publications are a part of the discourse in classrooms, key decisions, policy meetings, and international platforms. She is one of the most prolific researchers and authors whose monographs serve as a guiding light for educationists and researchers all over the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarangpani with a huge round of applause. Ma'am, the stage is all yours. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you, Siddesh, Madhukar, Professor Kamdar, for inviting me uh, to this symposium and in this really beautiful campus. I arrived last night and I've been enjoying this, this place tremendously. Um, I just... The slides I haven't, have are not really important. They're just there like a backdrop. Uh, it's really a pleasure to meet colleagues here who have been a part of my three decade long journey in education. Don and Zakia Korean, Subir, Vaijayanti, uh, Vimla Ramchandran, who's a part of the program, Rashmi Ji. Uh, it's, I think the reflections that I want to share today are probably going to be echoed by many of these colleagues who have been a part of this long effort uh, to work with systems in India and work on transformative agendas. Um, for at least uh, this, for several decades of my professional career, the field of education is a field of action and a field of pragmatics. Perhaps it's a field of action research and impact research, but not research as I was trained in. Uh, I was trained to think of education as a social science. It seemed to be fairly obvious how the system should be functioning, so we don't really need research to figure out how it should be functioning. We don't really seem to need research to figure out what the answers are. It seems that we need research to figure out how to do things, how to get it uh, to work better, how to deliver, how to work with teachers, and so on. And the problems of research seem to be finding out these issues of how to change things and how to manage the process of change, how to do it efficiently, effectively, and so on. But having been down that path, not just once, but many times, I thought I would use this talk to actually reflect uh, from a more research point of view on how do we think about the system and systems change. But to get us thinking about that, I want to share two slides. This morning, a young colleague was asking me, how do you just keep doing it? And I said, I'll save my answer for this keynote. Uh, I call it the Magdot syndrome. You have to bite and you can't let go, no matter what. 
and the second. Your old father William, the young man said, and your hair has turned very white. Yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William said as he shook his gray locks, I feared it might injure the brain. But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why I do it again and again? Yeah, three decades in this and I'm still standing on my head. <laughs> over and over again, not just once. It's not the original position. It's changed, but it still seems to be upside down. <laughs> yeah. So I want to use this talk to actually reflect on uh, three focal points around which I want to kind of organize um, what I understand about systems and systems develop, systems change, and ourselves in relation to it. And I've learned this through action, through reflection, through research, reading, and writing. And I think it really takes all of this. So the first focal point will be thinking about the teacher. The second will be how to get change to stick. And the third idea is uh, the meaning of inclusion and the right to education. So the slides aren't important, but they're just going to be there in the backdrop. Can you go to the next slide? That photograph is actually one of the earliest groups of teachers trained in a Madras teacher normal school. It's astounding, isn't it? The faces of those young teachers and the wide range, very young boys as well becoming teachers. And I find this photograph really useful to remind us of the origins of the profession and the origins of our thinking about teachers. It's quite paradoxical that as a system, we are obsessed with the teacher. But we are also obsessed with teacher-proofing the system and controlling and filling gaps and deficits. Educational programming in India is premised on a deficit view of the teacher. Whether it is you know, programs through which many of you have been, like um, a Teach for India or a cascaded foundation literacy numeracy program, the core assumptions of all these programs is that the teacher who is in the school today is deficient and immoral and cannot be trusted and will neglect her classroom and is overpaid and not deserving of the salary that she receives. The reasons for this deficit vision are numerous. We blame the poor quality of the teacher education program through which people go. We feel they haven't learned anything from there. We say it's not their profession of choice. It was their last resort. How can we expect them to be motivated? The motivation is low. They don't really commit to the profession. And so this deficit thinking really informs the way we think about systems and systems change. It's a very, very deep thinking. And researching about where does this idea come from? How is it that all of us are carrying this deficit notion of teachers in our minds? Where did it come from? You go back and you find the origins of this in colonial India. I mean, Professor Krishna Kumar has reminded us that teachers in colonial India were meek dictators. They weren't just meek dictators. The colonial system viewed the teacher through a deficit lens. In reports of colonial India, you will see repeated tracts describing how teachers are immoral, they don't come to school on time, they can't be trusted, they're not punctual, oh, the salary is so poor, how will anybody good come into the profession? This kind of lament constantly. And therefore, the need to control, to educate, to change, to reform, to manage the teacher. And this persisted. It was ironical that I would have thought that this would have flipped after we became independent. But no, somehow this, we, we shook off the deficit notion through which colonialists looked at Indians. But we ourselves didn't shake off this deficit cloak with which we viewed teachers. And this has actually persisted into post-independence India. It's carried into the earliest education policies and profiles, this kind of discourse of who's this teacher and the worthlessness of the teacher as a kind of a lament constantly in policy, and in fact, informing the way in which all of us think about the system. It's persisted today, and I think the origins of this are casteist, and they are classist. Most of us are from the middle class, but most teachers are from lower middle class or working class backgrounds. They are other. 
They have uh, worked, they have studied in vernacular schools. They have gone to Mufasil colleges in here two cities. So they're not like us. We have never encountered them in our classrooms as friends. So they are always the other. And increasingly today, if you look at the profile of government school teachers, they're dominated by members of the social scheduled castes, scheduled tribes through affirmative action. So the sense of othering and the worthlessness of the dominant teacher continues in the way in which we think about the system and the need to reform the system. And therefore, we are much more confident with our schooling, with our autobiographical memories of good teaching, we are confident that we know it. And we also seem to be confident that they don't. And this kind of othering, I think, is like a, forms the bedrock of a lot of programming continuing into even the new education policy uh, and initiatives that we make in the system. But of course, when we enter the field and we interact with teacher, we find that they have enormously strong professional identities and confidence, much more than we expected them to have. And they don't expect to feel any need to change, although we are sure that they need to, but they don't. They're confident about who they are and how to go about doing things. And we recognize that this is actually a strong professional identity. Maybe it's a positive resource. But the system itself is not designed to recognize it. And most of our programming is not premised that teachers are professionals carrying professional identities and worthy of it. We may not think that they're worthy of the professional identities that they're carrying, but they, in their own point of view, are confident that they are worthy of their professional identity. But that lack of this leads to teachers becoming instrumentalized and, be and institutions being developed without a principle of subsidiarity. We don't trust autonomy. We don't trust the judgments of teachers in the classroom or the diet faculty at the diet or the block resource center and all the way down. We're not able to give up control through a principle of trust. However, if we recognize professional identity, we will be compelled to look more seriously at professional knowledge and the formation of professional practice of teachers. This will draw our attention much more to the importance of pre-service teacher education and how it builds professional identity and gives professional knowledge. And I think all those of us who work in the in-service teacher education space and are repeatedly frustrated about our inability to impact in that space, I think we must remember that the core professional identity is already formed. But we will have a problem if we think of that professional identity as a problem. I think we really have to begin to think about how that is a resource from which we will move. But it also means that systems building has to pay attention to the pre-service space much more seriously. And I hope that this is something that we will uh, begin to recognize and uh, take more seriously going together. The second idea that I want to talk about is getting change to stick. Um, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and all of us who have been in this process of the, of the reform business uh, are frustrated with this. I mean, we have, we've done so many things, we've tried so many things, and it worked when we were there, and why isn't it sticking? When we leave, why does it seem that it's no longer there? Where are the traces of, of the efforts and the earlier programs and reforms that have you know, flowed through the system? It's not like we're acting today. In this country, we have at least, you know, 40 decade, I mean, four decade old effort to reform the system. Um, I've been looking closely at this whole argument around child-centered education. And there's this very strong argument now emerging that look, child-centered pedagogy are progressive pedagogies and they don't stick in systems which are basically formalist. We're looking at a cultural paradigmatic conflict. This is an argument that is made that you know, cultures like Indian cultures are formalist pedagogy cultures. And we cannot expect that a progressive pedagogy will stick in a culture which is basically formalist. Formalist meaning we value the authority of the teacher, we value student obedience, teaching is basically didactic and not conversational, hard work and learning and repetition is how things get into memory. These are some of the fundamental tenets that inform formalist pedagogies, 
But most of us sitting in this room, I would believe, don't really believe that this is how teaching learning should take place. So are we all bearers of some Western paradigm that will not stick in the Indian context? Are we really work, should we change the way we think about what it is that is to be reformed and how to do it and what we should see in the classrooms? There may be some truth to it. I mean, just remember that the Bukal Committee reintroduced failure into the right to education. When the right to education boldly said that a child's failure is not the personal failure of the child, but a systemic failure and no child should fail, the Bukal Committee put it right back saying, look, Indian children need fear. They need the fear of failure, otherwise they're not going to take education seriously. And that fail, the, you know, the no detention clause was removed from the right to education. So does that mean we are basically a formalist culture? And that we will not really, and we think that fear is essential for the process of learning? I think there's a contradiction, right? Many of us are saying, no, we don't really agree with this. We don't. So then how do we resolve this contradiction? I've been thinking about this problem. And I feel that the statement about the incommensurability of these two cultures, progressivist cultures and formalist cultures, is overstated. It's not like Indian culture has been standing in an isolated island away from the influences of the world. I mean, let's not forget whether it was Tagore, whether it was Gandhi, whether it was Pule. Uh, uh, All of them were engaged with the discourse of reform. And it is documented in submissions made to the committee, protest against an alien language being introduced. Why do we need vernacular tongue, a language so that we can think and learn with thinking and learn with understanding. So I, don't, I think the statement about incommensurability of cultures is overstated. But we need to recover the discourses that have been a part of our tradition and more strongly and confidently reclaim an indigenized progressivist reform. This is not the progressivist reform that came, say, for with the Andhra Pradesh Primary Education Project, which was kind of obsessed with getting children to sit in circles, as if by sitting in circle you change the pedagogical authority relationship in the classroom. But then what is that indigenous imagination of a progressivist, child-centered relationship between teachers and students? How can understanding be brought back and made center, center stage? How can meaning making be brought back and made center stage in the reform process? I think we need to recover the language of describing the progressivist uh, reform agenda in our own genius and in our own terms. And I think it's really important because today we find that there is a certain elite indigenous imagination which is capturing, which really is promoting only one indigenous idea of a teacher pupil, which is the guru in the ashram. But that's not the only idea of pedagogy, which is indigenous origin. I mean, think of the Panchatantra. It is full of stories about how the humble hare defeated the lion through tricks. Isn't that an important lesson? That you have to be wily, you have to be in the moment, you have to be solving problems, you have to formulate problems and change the paradigm. I think these narratives are part of our pedagogical traditions. And the basket of pedagogical options available to us indigenously, culturally, are much wider than the few which are promoted through elitist discourse. And I think we have a responsibility to, to recover this. And I think this recovery is important because this is the imagination of the vernacular. And no pedagogical reform attempt will succeed if it is not rooted in the vernacular. We have to find the discourse that resonates with the vernacular imagination. And I think these narratives are very important. And I think this is a project that we need. We need to strengthen this articulation. In fact, as I go through literature, I find there are so many pedagogical imaginations available to us. The Tantric Guru, the Baiga Guru, not only the Vedic Guru. Uh, there are many traditions of learning, the craft learning, the artisanal learning, all of which provide us with ways of thinking about relationships of teachers and students, the purposes of education, and the achievement of you know, fully grown, confident human beings at the end of the day. And I think this is something that we need to do. But this brings me to the point I want to make through this theme, which is that change is basically a cultural progress process. It is not a technological process. Change is not a technical 
shifting of application of new ideas. It is really a cultural shift and a cultural change. And for that, we need authentic engagement with our teachers and the, system, the vernacular system. We need to have an authentic engagement with it as equals. We need to share worldviews. We need to express the sources of our convictions and be willing to argue with the sources of other people's convictions. And I think that is the way in which cultures are learned and cultures change. I think that is really the project that we need to engage with. And the third idea. Um, this is something that I'm kind of relearning, which is really the meaning of inclusion and the right to education. I think it is only in the last decade that I'm fully understanding the ramification and indeed the importance of the right to education. And I learned this when I remember that the right to education is a part of the right to life with dignity. It is not just one of the many rights that are listed. It is written into the right to life. So if we have to understand the import of the right to education, we must understand that it is linked to the right to life with dignity. And I think that is the meaning that we need to engage with much more vigorously. So far, we have approached the right to education as if it was a social justice move, that you know we were including everybody into education, into the system of education. But we didn't fully consider how much the system of education itself needs to change in order to not only include, but also deliver right of life with dignity. I mean, the, the system of education as it was designed has not been designed to deliver right to life with dignity. It's designed to deliver some private goods through which you succeed in your life. So where will you find your right to, uh, life with dignity? Your home will help you find that life. But here we are saying that school has a responsibility to deliver that right to life with dignity. We're not just going to leave it to the private resources of the home to succeed in this journey. All of us are committed that everybody needs this life with dignity. And I think that is what we have to fully embrace in the understanding of this right. And so the system of education needs to change with this in focus. I think really the agenda of our education is so narrow. We, is, we are one of the few countries in the world which has not overcome the colonial legacy of a scholastically based, heavily literate school curriculum. We have just not overcome it. I go around the world, I find other countries have shaken it off. I mean, work is confidently in the school curriculum. Education for life, music, art is confidently in the school curriculum. Physical education, it's there in the school curriculum. But what are we delivering in our school curriculum? It's a very small sliver of what it takes to live right a life with dignity. And that's just not good enough. And I think that is really what we need to engage with. We need to think, what are the valuable ways in which we can be? And the school and the education needs to enable us to live those differentiated, valuable ways of being. And we need to be able to inherit and accomplish the wide things that culture offers us. We cannot restrict our imagination of school to the colonial school which we confidently ran with, or a certain notion of excellence, which in our society we seem to celebrate ad nauseum. I think this right to life with dignity needs more discourse, it needs research, it needs deliberation, it needs deep reflection. And this task of delivering right to life with dignity through education is important and it is noble. We cannot ignore how imperative it is today. And we must be concerned that it's not only about ensuring that education delivers its goods, which is what that good strain represents. It has to deliver goods. But also we have to make sure that the education system doesn't deliver bads. I mean, we cannot have education system teaching, telling people that you're worthless, you're a failure, you're not good enough, you're, you deserve to be humiliated. We can't have an education system teaching under confidence. I mean, it's a bad. It's bad for society, it's bad for the person, and that's life without dignity. And I think we have to really engage with this task and this imperative that uh, education must respond to and must answer. 
And I think our imagination of systems change and systems reform needs to be informed by this view of education, the right to education in this inclusive imagination. Thank you.